Hello, welcome back to the King's Podcast, The Wellness Dive with Lucky. I'm your host, Esther Lucky. Today we are joined by the new King's College Hospital London in Dubai CEO, Kimberly Ann Pierce. She'll be taking a deep dive into the industry, the healthcare industry, her career, and where the industry is headed. Welcome, Ms. Kimberly. Thank you. I'm really happy to join you today. So I'm going to start by asking you, who exactly is Kimberly Ann Pierce? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, I guess I'm many people, if you like, from a career perspective. Um, I'm a person who uh, started my career as a registered nurse. So I trained in um, Portsmouth in England. And then when I went on to do my postgraduate training in cardiac nursing in Nottingham in England. And then from there, my career really was in nursing for many years in England, um, South Africa and Australia. And then I was fortunate enough to become an executive director in critical care. And then from there, just went up the ladder, went into management, um, did the usual things that you do, MBA. I did my INSEAD advanced management program in France and have been CEO of hospitals in England and Australia probably for the last 10, 12 years. So that's the career, Kimberly. Um, the personal Kimberly, I have um, three grown up children, two of whom, well, in fact, all of them are in the healthcare market mm-hmm. as well. Uh, they're all living in Australia. So, um, and then I've got grandchildren as well. Wow. Um, and my hobbies, I enjoy rowing. So, I've already looked at rowing in Dubai um, and yoga. So, those are my main hobbies. Yeah. To be honest, you look so fit. <laughs> Thank you. So um, it's been a week since you joined us, roughly. Yes. Uh, what would you say are the key strengths of Kings Dubai? I'm sure you didn't just wake up one morning and decide that you're going to move your life to Dubai. You must have done some homework, research and all that. What are the key strengths of Kings? You're absolutely right that I did a lot of research. Um, I was a CEO in London. Uh, for five years. So I know King's as a brand and reputation very well. Um, It's synonymous with quality and positive clinical outcomes. So when I did my research, it was more about being part of King's that really attracted me. And I came and visited Dubai and it is a beautiful country. Um, It's an extremely multicultural country and people are very friendly. So that was the attraction. Um, Then what was interesting is coming to King's in Dubai to see that the same quality that is known in London is replicated here at King's in Dubai as well. Um, We're fortunate enough to have a lot of doctors that are excellent and are leaders in their field across the world. And that's something to be proud of. Uh, The fact that we're starting to really get involved in research means that we're contributing back to the community as well. And I think that's really important. It's not just about being kings dubai it's about what we can also give back to the community of dubai Mm -hmm. and that's hopefully something that i will bring as well and i think the other thing is the nursing staff are a high standard if you were to say what do i think we can do even better i think that we can certainly enhance our education and training and make that even better i think we're also a victim of our own success in that we have an issue that other hospitals will always try and poach our staff because they know that we train and our staff are amongst the best in the country. And that's a dilemma because on the one hand, it can be a positive for the staff member, but we've invested a lot of our time too. So um, we are a victim of our own success as well. Indeed we are. So you've been working in uh, what I would call three continents, Africa, Europe, down south. How is healthcare different here in the UAE compared to, let's say, Australia, where you spent most of your career? It actually isn't that different. So um, private healthcare is very similar. If I look at private healthcare across those three continents, they're very, very similar. 
Um, focus is always on positive patient outcomes. Um, we mustn't hide or shy away from the fact that it is private and therefore there's profit attached to that. Um, but the patient will always come first regardless. Uh, and that's the same across all those continents. That doesn't change. All right, all right. Okay. Uh, so we're going to move away from the career Kimberley back to personal Kimberley. So um, to get to this point in your career, what path did you take? As I said, I started off nursing. I, I do believe that as a CEO, one of the strengths is having a strong clinical background. It means that I understand what's going on from a clinical perspective. I've worked in operations on the ground for many, many years. So I know how hospitals function. Um, and that's a huge positive for me. And it makes my job a lot easier because I understand the operational side. As a CEO, I think having that background is really positive. Yeah. Okay, so uh, speaking of being CEO, uh, have you ever wanted to be a CEO, considering your background in nursing? Or when you were studying a nursing career, did you ever think you'd end up as a CEO of such big health facilities? No, absolutely not. Um, I really loved nursing. And um, my favourite time was when I was the charge nurse of a um, critical care unit, mainly cardiac, mm -hmm. and I loved it. And if um, and I remember being asked if I would be an assistant director of nursing, and at first I was horrified because it was no, these are my patients. I love my patients. Why would I? go and do something else in management because at that time you think management is one of those things that nurses don't aspire to and then they, they said to me will you just do it short term while we find somebody else for the role uh, short term became two years so um, I kind of fell into it it was never an aspiration I just fell into it and then I realised that being in senior roles meant that I could make a difference and change things as well. Mm -hmm. And so that was then the reason why I continued, if you like, was that ability then to make decisions and have the be empowered to make those decisions. Speaking of management, um, what's your general approach to it, especially in healthcare? And uh, what would you value most within your team? So I'll probably reverse the question. So the executive team is critical for any organisation. The main thing is that the leadership team has to be visible. The staff need to know who is leading them. Otherwise, why would you follow? So one of the key things that I will be expecting of our leadership team, and we've got a good team, yes. is that um, we're visible, that the staff on the floor know who we are and what we do. That will be critical for what we do going forward. We really do appreciate that. <laughs> so um, what are some of the biggest challenges in the healthcare industry? And uh, how do you think we can tackle that? There are quite a few challenges and everyone knows the challenge we had with COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think now the challenge from that has been all the different variants that have followed. And recently it was announced uh, globally that it is likely that we will continue to have pandemics. And I think those will be a challenge and it will be how we manage those. But we can't continue to close down countries. Uh, I think everyone's understood that that really isn't the way we can manage going forward because it affects the global economy at the same time. So I think that is a challenge on how we manage that. I think that society is probably now very familiar with that as a yeah. challenge. Yeah. I think the other challenges are new technologies. I think keeping pace with the change of new technologies is a challenge. Uh, and, and coupled with that is automation, artificial intelligence. Where does that all fit within the healthcare sector? And the reality is it does fit. Um, people have struggled with moving away from human interaction sometimes to, say, robotic interaction. But that is the way we're going. And we need to start embracing that and look at how we introduce that to the market. So another challenge the world is facing is a shortage of nurses. In fact, to, uh, according to a recent report, an estimated 13 million nurses 
will need to fill the cup by 2030. The alarm bells are ringing currently, especially after the COVID pandemic. What's the way forward? How can this be tackled? So I think we need to understand that, yes, it has been an issue for many, many years, but in previous times, it was a age issue. So we had an aging workforce and how do we um, then recruit and train nurses quickly? So that was an issue. Then post pandemic, we've had a burnout problem. That's a global issue. We have a mass exodus of nurses from the sector and there are young nurses. So they're the wrong group that are exiting the organisation. Mm -hmm. We need to look at, say, in 12 months time, whether those same nurses are ready to come back. We also need to think about how we train our nurses. Now, we move to a degree university-based training for nurses. The reality is that maybe we need to start considering a different approach, which is we go back to on-the-job training Mm -hmm. coupled with university so that nurses are actually already in the hospital because the other drain from nursing is actually within the education sector. They never finish their training. They stay at university or they come and do a placement in a hospital and realise it's not what they want. But because they've spent most of their time in a university, they haven't been exposed to what hospital work actually is. So I think there are a few approaches we need to make. One is that we need to work closely with the universities and look at how we can do partnerships whereby their training isn't just in the universities with short placements in hospitals. And maybe we'll reverse that. The other thing is whether we subsidise the fees that are payable for education for nurses to attract more into the marketplace. Certainly in Australia and in the UK, you pay for your university education. We need to look at subsidising that to attract people into the workforce. So I think that there's not a one approach. I think there's multiple approaches that we need to do. Mm -hmm. And the hospital needs to work with the universities to come up with the best solution. What would you tell a young nurse who's just beginning her career? I would say that you're about to start in the best career of your life. I'm biased, I'm a nurse, um, but it really is a privilege to look after sick people. To be able to look after them when they're at their most vulnerable is a privilege. It's also a very rewarding time. It's rewarding because you get to see people get better, but it's also rewarding because if somebody does pass away, you get to be there at that time as well. And that's a privilege too. So nursing is rewarding. It's also stimulating. There's lots to learn. It's fascinating. Human body is fascinating. For me, I think it's probably one of the most exciting careers that you can ever have. Amazing. Speaking of which, do you miss um, hands-on patient care? I do. And that's why I've already said that I'll be doing ward rounds once a week with um, Tash Bean. So... I still like to do ward rounds because I just enjoy Mm -hmm. being with the patients. But also it gives the nurses a chance to see me, know who I am. I'm also inherently nosy. I like to know what's going on as well. We have an an ED doctor here who undertakes ward rounds of the whole hospital every morning. Mm -hmm. So I've already said to him that I would like to join him once a week. Dr. Tashfin. Dr. Tashfin. We'll be having him soon on the podcast. He's absolutely amazing. So I'm going to be joining him once a week. So we should be ready to see you in scrubs and sneakers. Absolutely. Yes. And I like going into theatres too. Oh, wow. Looking forward to that. Maybe we can take a selfie. Yes, we can. (laughs) So um, finally, um, Kimberly, what do you think is the next big thing? in healthcare advancement. It's going to be artificial intelligence, Mm -hmm. virtual hospitals, automation. Tell us more about that. I understand you're very passionate about it. I am passionate about it. And it's not to replace the staff. It's not to replace that human touch and that people interaction. It's actually to make things easier. So, and easier for the patient. So simple things like patients should be able to log in um, at home, they should be able, telehealth got big during COVID. How quickly did we uh, accelerate that? There are other things that we can do with AI. AI, we know, reads um, x-ray reports with 99% accuracy. So why 
wouldn't we use that? It's better mm-hmm. for the patient, um, better for their clinical outcomes. So there's things like that. Then there's virtual hospitals where we can monitor people at home. Uh, they mm-hmm. don't need to come in. So, you know, hospitals still are places that have bugs. So sometimes it is better to monitor a patient at home. We can do that. So there's all of that. And then there's so much more that's coming down the pipeline that we can do. But I want to stress that it doesn't replace that human touch. It doesn't replace that human interaction, because I think society and human beings like to have that interaction with another human being that's who we are so it isn't to replace that it's to enhance what we currently do something just popped into my head when you spoke about a hospital at home kings is uh, launching a hospital at home service line do you think that can become more accepted can it be a successful service line and how can that work so i've set up hospital in the home probably across three countries Um, And I think, again, COVID has helped hospital in the home in many respects because we had to do it. The thing is, if you look at the results of those times during COVID when we had hospital in the home, patient satisfaction actually increased because people enjoyed the fact that they didn't have to find car parking, come into a hospital, wait in queues, uh, and also they're not being exposed to certain things. So hospital in the home can work exceptionally well for certain conditions, not all conditions. So I think that we have a high chance of success. But uh, hospital at home cannot be used for emergency cases? No, no it can't. It's purely for things, known conditions. So if a person comes into the emergency department with a wound infection, that can very well be managed at home with dressings and antibiotics and nurses will come out to the home. What we mustn't forget, though, is that patient is still under the governance of a doctor. So it's they're still being seen by a doctor. They're still being monitored by a doctor and a nurse is still going out into the home. It is what it says. It's a hospital in the home. It's not an inferior treatment. It's actually a superior treatment for those the conditions that can be managed in the home. Is it also covered by insurance? The way uh, when they come to the hospital, they're covered by insurance? Or it depends with the plan? I don't know. Can't answer <laughs> that question. <laughs> I guess we'll be able to answer that when you get it. Once I find, I have only been here a week. Yeah, um, I know. <laughs> so I will find that out. I, I really mm-hmm. don't know. Mm-hmm. I haven't looked at it at all yet. Yeah, I'm sure most people will be wondering the same. And rightly so. Yeah. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. There you have it. Kimberly and Pierce, New King CEO. We will be seeing her again at the six month mark. See you again soon. Bye bye.